devil on Washington Rock. The dream was so vivid, she didn't realize at first that it was a dream. The party was crowded, the guests cheerful, the food delicious. Then a rumor began to circulate among the guests. The devil was coming to the party. The devil was on the way. She didn't pay much attention at first, until a hush came over the crowd. Turning to see what it was, she saw a tall, handsome blonde man standing in the doorway greeting his hostess. Around her, the murmurs began. It was the devil. He had come. She watched out of the corner of her eye as the devil made the rounds of the room. He looked so ordinary, it was hard to believe he was the devil. Then he came to her group. As soon as he joined them, she knew the rumor was true. This was not someone to be trifled with. Frightened, she grabbed for a Bible her hostess had left lying on a nearby end table and threw it at the devil. For a moment, their eyes locked. The devil's eyes were full of ferocious anger, terrible evil, and malevolent malice directed right at her. She thought she was dead. Then she woke and lay trembling in her bed with the light on until dawn. The next morning was the end of term. Her parents and younger sister helped her clear out her dorm room and pack the car. It was dusk before they settled into their seats for the two-hour drive home. They talked excitedly as they drove towards their home in New Jersey, interrupting each other often, contradicting themselves and laughing. It was good to be together again. They were 15 minutes from home when they left the highway. Her father turned onto Washington Rock Road that led up the mountain through the sea bend around the Washington Rock State Park and then down the other side of the mountain. As they drove up the steep hill, a noisy motorcycle tailgated them, trying to pass even though the road was windy and narrow. Finally, the hill grew so steep that the driver was forced to slow down and eventually, they pulled away from him entirely. The car reached the top of the hill and started around the long sea curve that took them through one end of the park. The park was dark and still. The whole family automatically looked to their right, out over the gorgeous view of the New York City skyline. They all saw the small park cart, sitting next to the road just inside the park boundary. It was parked directly underneath the only street light, where you couldn't fail to see it. And inside the vehicle, she started trembling fiercely. Inside the vehicle was a tall, handsome blonde man with eyes full of ferocious anger, terrible evil, and malevolent malice. It was the man from her dream. The man everyone said was the devil. The tension in the car was palpable. She had mentioned her dream to no one, but her parents and her sister all felt the evil pulsing from the still figure in the cart. No one spoke as they drove past the man. Suddenly, the engine gave a strange cough. Her father gunned the motor once, twice in a silent, desperate battle to keep moving. She gripped her hands together, praying silently as she stared at the figure opposite their car. The engine caught again and her father pressed down hard on the accelerator. Then they were past the man and roaring away from the park and towards the downward slope of the mountain. She was sweating profusely, unable to stop shaking. She looked back out the window at the man in the park and saw the motorcycle come roaring at last to the top of the hill. It drove halfway around the sea bend and as it drew opposite the figure in the cart, she heard the engine of the motorcycle cough. And then stall. And then the park was out of view and they were riding silently towards home, not daring to speak until they were safely indoors. She often wondered what happened to the man on the motorcycle. Dispatched. There was something odd in the tone of the dispatcher's voice when he called to tell me a person needed picking up at Bramlett Road late one summer night in 1947. I shuddered when I heard the name of the street. I did not want to go anywhere near that area especially at midnight. But I drove a yellow cab, and it was my job to pick up a call when it came. So I swallowed and headed toward Bramlett Road and the slaughter yards. I'd been out of town when the incident happened. I call it an incident, but it was murder, plain and not so simple. A fellow named Brown who drove a cab with our company was robbed and stabbed to death in his cab. 
Next day, a man named Willie Earl was picked up by the police the very next day and put in jail for the crime, though he denied doing it. Then a bunch of hotheads who drove cabs for our company gathered together, passed around a bottle of whiskey and talking about getting the fellow who'd stabbed Brown. One of the men went out and borrowed a shotgun, and the mob drove to the jail, grabbed Earl, and threw him in the back of one of the cabs. The hotheads took him to the slaughter yards, and they dragged Earl forcibly from the cab and started beating him. A man pulled a knife and waded into the mob with it, and Earl shouted, Lord, you've killed me. That's when the fellow with the shotgun put a bullet in his head, reloaded, and shot him twice more. When the mob was sure he was dead, they climbed back into their separate cabs and fanned out, each heading back to the city by a different route. Eventually word got out and 31 fellows were arrested for the crime. But they were all acquitted by a jury of their peers. After the incident, the slaughterhouse section of Bramlett Road got a bad reputation. No one in the cab company much liked driving there, especially at night. Folks claimed it was haunted by the ghost of Willie Earl. I shivered as I pulled onto Bramlett Road and slowed down to look for my passenger. No one was there. I parked the cab and got out to have a quick smoke while I waited. All at once, the temperature around me plummeted. I froze in place, suddenly terrified, as someone moaned in terror from the other side of the road. The sound scraped my nerves raw. I could hear the unmistakable thud of hammering fists and the darkness was filled with swirling black silhouettes pounding on something or someone. I fumbled for the icy cold door handle as a man shouted agony, Lord, you've killed me. I threw myself inside the cab as a gun exploded, cutting off the man's cries. The shot was swiftly followed by two more. I squealed the tires as I spun the cab around. A tall, battered figure that glowed just enough for me to see its lolling head, the blood-stained, dead features, the knife-torn clothes blocked the road in front of me. I gasped, floored the gas pedal and swerved around it, heart hammering so hard it hurt my ribs. I was still trembling when slammed into the office a few minutes later and told the dispatcher I was quitting. Then I grabbed my things and headed for home lickety-split. There was no way I was going to Bramlett Road ever again. And I never did. Don't turn on the light. She commandeered the room in the basement of her dorm as soon as she realized she would have to pull an all-nighter in order to prepare for tomorrow's final exam. Her roommate, Jenna, liked to get to bed early, so she packed up everything she thought she would need and went downstairs to study, and study, and study some more. It was two o'clock when she realized that she'd left one of the textbooks upstairs on her bed. With a dramatic sigh, she rose and climbed the stairs slowly to her third floor dorm room. The lights were dim in the long hallway and the old boards creaked under her weary tread. She reached her room and turned the handle as softly as she could, pushing the door open just enough to slip inside so that the hall lights wouldn't wake her roommate. The room was filled with a strange, metallic smell. She frowned a bit, her arms breaking out into chills. There was a strange feeling of malice in the room, as if a malevolent gaze were fixed upon her. It was a mind trick, the all-nighter was catching up with her. She could hear Jenna breathing on the far side of the room a heavy sound, almost as if she had been running. Jenna must have picked up a cold during the last tense week before finals. She crept along the wall until she reached her bed, groping among the covers for the stray history textbook. In the silence, she could hear a steady drip 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 sound. She sighed silently. Facilities would have to come to fix the sink in the bathroom again. Her fingers closed on the textbook. She picked it up softly and withdrew from the room as silently as she could. Relieved to be out of the room, she hurried back downstairs collapsed into an overstuffed chair and studied until six o'clock. She finally decided that enough was enough. If she slipped upstairs now, she could get a couple hours sleep before her nine o'clock exam. The first of the sun's rays were beaming through the windows as she slowly slid the door open, hoping not to awaken Jenna. Her nose was met by an earthy, metallic smell a second before her eyes registered the scene in her dorm room. 
Jenna was spread eagled on top of her bed against the far wall, her throat cut from ear to ear and her nightdress stained with blood. Two drops of blood fell from the saturated blanket with a drip drip noise that sounded like a leaky faucet. Scream after scream poured from her mouth, but she couldn't stop herself any more than she could cease wringing her hands. All along the hallway, doors slammed and footsteps came running down the passage. Within moments other students had gathered in her doorway, and one of her friends gripped her arm with a shaking hand and pointed a trembling finger toward the wall. Her eyes widened in shock at what she saw. Then she fainted into her friend's arms. On the wall above her bed, written in her roommate's blood, were the words, Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? The face. The medical student toppled into love as soon as he set eyes on Sheila, the beautiful new transfer student. She had masses of long black hair and eyelashes so long they got tangled in her curls when she leaned over her desk. The medical student had a withdrawn nature, though not by inclination. He'd learned the hard way that people avoided him when they heard about his insane father, locked away in an asylum. But he had to overcome his taciturn nature or risk losing Sheila to one of the other fellows that panted after her. So the medical student volunteered to tutor her Sheila in one of her classes. After that, it was easy. Sheila toppled into love with the medical student as madly as he was in love with her. They went everywhere together, hardly bearing to part for classes. The medical student lived in a bubble of joy until the day he saw Sheila speaking to a good-looking fellow who lived in the same dorm. They were laughing together over something one of their professors had said in history class, and a shaft of sheer jealousy pierced the medical student's gut. How dare she laugh with another man? He confronted his Sheila with her perceived trespass, and she stared at him incredulously. You're crazy, she said. He winced, reminded of his father, and shouted insults at Sheila until she stalked off in a rage. They made up over dinner, and things were fine for a while until the medical student saw Sheila borrow a pen from a handsome blonde fellow at the library. That set him off again. They hissed angry words at each other until the librarian kicked them out. The medical student huddled on the narrow bed in his dorm room until black anger gave way to common sense. He called Sheila and apologized. She accepted his apology and they were back together. The medical student was scheduled to take Sheila to a local dance on Friday night, so he rushed back to the dorm to dress in his best. As he turned to leave, the medical student noticed that a scalpel had fallen out of his medical bag and lay haphazardly on his desk. He thrust it carelessly inside the bag and went to pick up his girlfriend and escort her to the dance. The couple had a fabulous evening, dancing and drinking and eating. They left the party around midnight and walked hand in hand back to his dorm room for a nightcap. When they reached the entryway, Sheila veered off for a moment to ask a red-haired fellow from one of her art classes about an assignment that was due the next day. The medical student was instantly filled with gut gnawing jealousy. When Sheila rejoined him, he hustled her upstairs to his room and shouted, You flirt with every man you meet, you tramp. You are crazy. Sheila shouted back. Stark raving mad. The boyfriend saw red. Don't call me mad he said, his hand groping for the loose scalpel and his medical bag on the desk. When the mist cleared from his eyes, Sheila lay dead at his feet, her throat cut from ear to ear. The whole room was covered with red gore and her masses of black hair lay in a pool of steaming blood. The medical student's brain went into overdrive. Hide the body. Clean up the blood. Invent an alibi. But first... He stared at the dead girl he had loved so much, then he knelt beside the body and slowly cut off her face. He wrapped the face carefully in plastic before putting it in his desk drawer. Then he cleaned up the blood and hid the body in a tunnel near the laundry room. The next morning, the medical student told his roommate Sheila had broken up with him and gone home in a snit without finishing her classes. The roommate accepted the story without question and didn't appear to notice the way the medical student peered obsessively inside his desk drawer. The medical student finally tore himself away Sheila's face to attend his 11 o'clock class. 
When he returned at lunchtime, he found his roommate leaning out of the open window, looking ill. I think I have flu. I'd best run to the pharmacy and pick up something for it, the roommate said when he came in. Want me to take a look? The medical student asked, reaching for his bag. His roommate turned white. No. Thank you. Don't bother, he gasped, practically running from the room. The medical student shrugged in exasperation, peered into the drawer at Sheila's face, and settled down to work on a paper he had due next week. Downstairs, his roommate was on the phone with the police. The medical student went ballistic when the police came with a warrant to arrest him. They manhandled him out of his chair while a grim-faced officer took a look in the desk drawer. When he saw the dead girl's face, the officer swore violently and vomited on the floor. The medical student was placed in the asylum with his father, who was locked away in a padded room next door. Every day, while his enraged father tried to kill his attendants, the bereft boyfriend wept and stared out the window, seeing Sheila's lovely face in the branches of a nearby tree. The face seemed to sway to the rhythm of his father's fists as his insane parent pounded and pounded at the walls. Back in the dorm, the ghost of a young girl in a blood-stained dress still floats along the hallways, searching for her face. Goblin of Easton There was once a monk at the mission who loved money and power more than he loved God. He would hear the confession of the good folk who attended the mission, and then would blackmail them into giving him gold and silver to keep their darkest secrets. He turned many a wayward sinner's feet towards the fires of hell rather than the gates of heaven, encouraging their crimes in secret while he reviled them in public. It was after he beat one poor old woman to death that the evil monk was imprisoned and sentenced to hang for his crimes. But just after he was cut down from the noose and pronounced dead, his corpse began to transform before the horrified eyes of the people. The face twisted and small tusks sprang from either side of his nose. His shock of white hair grew long and greasy, and two pointed canines emerged from his slit of a mouth. The goblin monk opened eyes that glowed yellow even in the light of noonday, and sprang to feet that now ended in claws rather than toes. The people screamed and fled, and no prayer of his former brothers in faith could banish the goblin. It disappeared deep into the forest, only to return at night and prey upon the monks of the mission who had been responsible for its death. After five of the brothers had fallen to the goblin, the rest of the monks abandoned the mission and moved to another part of the country. Since that time, the mission house had slowly fallen into ruin. Golden Hand He never paid much attention to the neighbors living on his city block until the day the pretty middle-aged widow moved in two doors down from him. She was plump and dark with sparkling eyes, and she always wore dark gloves on her hands, even indoors. He went out of his way to meet her, and they often bumped into each other in the street and stood talking. One day, as she brushed the hair back from her forehead, he caught a glimpse of gold under the glove on her right arm. When he asked her about it, she grinned coquettishly and told him that she had lost one hand a few years back and now wore a golden hand in its place. In that moment, a terrible lust woke in his heart not to possess the lady herself, but to possess the solid gold hand that she wore under her long black gloves. He courted the widow with every stratagem known to him, flowers, trips to the theater, gifts, compliments. And he won her heart. Within a month, they were standing in front of a minister, promising to love one another until death parted them. Within another month, he was a widower and had buried his ailing wife in the local cemetery without her golden hand. It had been so easy. A slow poison administered daily to resemble a wasting disease. No one, not his wife, not the family doctor, not their neighbors suspected murder. And the night after the funeral, he slept with the golden hand under his pillow. It was a dark night. Clouds covered the moon and the wind was whistling down the chimney and rattling the shutters of the townhouse. He was deeply asleep when the door to his room slammed open with a loud bang and a wild wind whipped around the room, scattering papers and books and clothing and table coverings every which way. He sat up, startled by the sudden noise, and his pulse began to pound when he saw a greenish-white light bobbing slowly into the room. 
Before his eyes, the light slowly grew larger, taking on the shape of his dead wife. She was missing one arm. Where's my golden hand? She moaned, her dark eyes blazing with red fire. Give me my golden hand. He tried to speak, but his mouth was so dry with fear that he could only make soft gasping noises. The glowing phantom moved closer to him, her once lovely face twisted into a hideous green mask. You stole my life and you stole my hand. Give me back my golden hand, the dead wife howled. The noise rose higher and higher, and the phantom pulsed with a strident green light that smote his eyes, making them water. He cowered back against his pillows, and the hard shape of the golden hand pressed against his back. And then he felt the golden hand twitch underneath him as the mangled green phantom that had been his wife swooped down upon him, pressing his face against the pillow in a suffocating green cloud. He tried to scream, but it was cut off suddenly by a terrible pressure against his throat, cutting off his breath. The world went black. The next morning, when the housemaid came into the room with her master's morning cup of tea, she found him lying dead on the floor with the golden hand clutched around his throat.